All right, well, good evening to you. Thank you very much for joining us uh, tonight for our Wednesday night Bible study. Uh, if you want to go ahead and turn in your Bibles to the book of Luke, chapter 19 is where we'll be at tonight. We're going to be looking at the first 27 verses. We're coming down towards the uh, end of Jesus' ministry and preparing for uh, his time, uh, the, what we call his passion or the sufferings he went through. Um, so we want to, of course, keep each other in prayer in these times, especially when we are um, not able uh, to be able to meet together as much as we would like. So let's be praying for one another. And uh, a couple of notices, of course, the youth meeting tomorrow evening, 6 o'clock. Uh, that'll be over Zoom, so the young people can join it that way. Also on Saturday, uh, we'll have a young adult uh, Zoom meeting, so the young adults are welcome there. And then we'll be going out leafleting on Saturday, quarter past 11, so 15 minutes later than normal. And uh, we want to continue to get the gospel out. Then our Bible Institute is starting coming up uh, a week from Saturday. So we're excited about that. If you're interested, you can go on the church website and find some information there. And uh, we're looking forward to a great time with that. If you have any questions, let me know. All right, let's uh, take our Bibles tonight and go to the book of Luke, chapter 19. Uh, we're going to read uh, these uh, verses. We'll, we'll start by reading the first 10 verses, and then we'll move into the next section. Uh, but this is a great story. I remember as a boy, we would sing a song about, about Zacchaeus being a wee little man. And uh, it must have been written by an Irishman or something like that with the word wee in there. Uh, but uh, this is that story, and um, it is a great story. I really like Zacchaeus' enthusiasm. I like his uh, willingness to be a bit unconventional, which is... Uh, an important character trait in these days, this day and age in which we live. And I love how he receives the Lord Jesus, and he's just so excited uh, to be saved, and he really wants to use all that he has for the Lord. So uh, if we can begin our reading in verse 1. Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be guest with the man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. If I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Well, let's pray together tonight and ask God's blessing on our time in His Word. Heavenly Father, thank You for Your Word. Thank You for another look into the ministry that You had on this earth and how You continually were aware of individuals, even though You were surrounded by lots of people. You always had time for just one who was seeking and Lord, we thank you for the example as well of Zacchaeus, who, though a sinful man, uh, sought you out and uh, was saved. And I pray, Lord, that you would do a great work in our lives, and I pray that you will help us to not only find the salvation for those who may not be saved, but also to live as your servants and to use the uh, opportunity, the lives that you've given to us, uh, for the building up of your kingdom, the furtherance of your gospel in these uh, in very important days in which we have an opportunity to point people to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, um, we're going to, the first title, the first point I've got for you, I just have two points, is we're thinking about the Son of Man coming, which is a title for Jesus. And the first thing we're going to notice in the first 10 verses is he came to seek the lost. So 
Um, the next point is going to look at really a second coming and uh, focus on what those who are his disciples should be doing. But this is about Jesus coming to seek the lost. And, you know, all of these things in, in the different gospel records are there for a reason. They're there to um, communicate a message. And the timing is very important as well. We talked last week about the blind man who uh, called out to Jesus for sight and he saw uh, and he believed and uh, he was saved. But he served a larger purpose, and that was to be an example and a rebuke to the nation of Israel who thought they saw, but really they were blind. And I think the same is true here with Zacchaeus. Is he was not uh, someone you would have thought would have come to Jesus. At least the Jewish people would have felt that way. Uh, because he was basically a traitor. He is a, you know, probably about the lowest you could get. I mean, imagine... Imagine your neighbor um, begins to report to the police on all of your activities and even lies about stuff you're doing that you're not doing in order to uh, advance themselves or in order, in order to maybe even make themselves wealthy. You would have very little time for that person. And that's really what these publicans were doing. They were partnering with outsiders, the Roman invaders, had come into Israel and the Romans kind of um, outsourced or contracted the work of collecting taxes to these men. And so what they would do is they worked for the Romans, they would tax their friends and neighbors and countrymen, and they would also charge extra to pay uh, themselves and they would get rich off of their own people. So, I mean, they were pretty, they were pretty scummy, to be honest with you. They were pretty sorry, uh, and, uh, and that's why most people didn't have a lot of time for them. But Jesus did, because Jesus saw in them a brokenness and a humility, and uh, many of them came to faith in Jesus, including uh, one of the disciples who Matthew, we know as Matthew. He was a publican. But notice uh, the Bible says in verse 1, Jesus entered a pass through Jericho. So Jesus was, is on his fin the final leg of his journey to Jerusalem. Uh, Jericho, uh, there was a kind of an infamous road between Jericho and Jerusalem. Uh, the parable of the Good Samaritan, the man that is robbed and beaten is left on this road. So it runs through the mountains to Jerusalem. And Jesus is beginning that on that road. But uh, as he does, as he passes through Jericho, uh, there's a man there named Zacchaeus, and Jesus is quite surrounded by a crowd of people. If you notice in verse 3, it says uh, there's the press there, so the, the, the crowds are pressing in. But on his way, another man is desperate to see Jesus. He's just finished healing the blind man. Now we find another man who was even more of an outcast coming to Jesus, and his name is Zacchaeus. So this is Luke 19 and verse 2. Now the Bible says there, he was the chief among the publicans. So not only was he, publican just means tax collector, and not only was he a publican, but he was chief among publicans. So maybe he had other tax collectors that worked for him. And so he is uh, really making money hand over fist here off of his own people, and he has become very wealthy. Um, and this uh, reminds us, if you remember, back in Luke chapter 18, if you just look up there, uh, look at verses 23 to 25. So the riches, and there's these different themes here. If you remember, there was another rich man that came to Jesus. He would have been on the opposite side of the social and religious spectrum. Spectrum. Uh, Zacchaeus was way over here, like the traitorous, uh, covetous uh, outcast. The rich young ruler is religious and, um, you know, a very moral person. But look what happened here in Luke 18, verse 23. The Bible says, when he heard this, he was very sorrowful, for he was very rich. So he turns from Jesus 
And Jesus, when Jesus saw that he was very sorrowful, he, Jesus said, How hardly shall they that, are, that have riches enter the kingdom of God? It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. So Jesus has stated that it's very difficult for rich people to come into the kingdom. So now we have another rich man. We have Zacchaeus, and we're wondering how are things going to turn out for him. But he's going to show us that the right attitude, and he's going to show us the humility that's necessary to come to Jesus. But the Bible says in verse 3 that Zacchaeus sought to see Jesus. So he is really wants to see Jesus. Now, I want to ask you, why? Why do you think he wants to see Jesus? What do you think it was that made him want to see Jesus? Anybody have any thoughts? I can offer a few suggestions, but I don't know if you have any thoughts. Okay, yeah, I think that's a good point. I mean, he's enjoying a lot of popularity at this point, and so he just wants to maybe know what's all the, the stir about. I think that's a good point. Okay, he's curious to see who he was, and you, you get that impression because he's trying to get through the crowd, and then he, of course, climbs up in the tree to see who is this man. We don't really know what exactly it was, but what we do know is there was something inside of him that was curious, and possibly there was something inside of him that was thinking, maybe there's more. From an external point of view, it looked like he had it all together. The Bible says, verse 2, he was rich, and in every culture, in every age, there is the idea, there is the belief that isn't really true, but many people believe it, that if you're rich, you're happy. Unfortunately, uh, that's just simply not true. So could it be that while he sat in his wealthy home, while he sat in his, with his riches, looking around thinking, I actually have everything I ever dreamed of. I've I've worked my whole life to get to this stage, and he thought, I don't, I don't feel satisfied. I think that's very possible. Um, could he also have felt guilt? Could he have felt badly about the way he had treated people? Because later he's going to confess he had um, you know, falsely accused people. But something was going on in his life, and he wants to see Jesus. There are many verses actually in the book of Luke, even just itself, that talk about publicans coming to Jesus. Um, you can write down a couple. Luke 3, verse 12. Uh, Luke 7, verse 29. And Luke 15, verse 1. The publicans and sinners were coming to Jesus to hear him. So maybe he, other publicans had come. He had met maybe Levi or Matthew. Uh, or others that had went to hear Jesus, but he was drawn to Jesus. And of course, we know that he saw Jesus, but Jesus was also seeking him. Because if you look at verse number 10, what's the Bible say? The Son of Man has come to seek and to save. And when Zacchaeus is in the tree, the Lord Jesus is going to stop and look up. So the Lord was working in his life, I believe, and that's why he is seeking out Jesus. But he could not because he was little of stature. So he, he's trying, and in my mind, and maybe you've seen cartoons, it's my mind, I kind of see Zacchaeus, you know, trying to push in there, and people kind of elbowing him out of the way. And, uh, you know, of course, in, in Britain, you know, we have a very uh, organized queuing system most of the time, but in other cultures, it's not so much that way. And if you've ever been in another culture where people don't queue, it can be major culture shock. I, I've been in other countries where, you know, you're politely standing, and people just keep coming in front of you, and you're like, what's happening here? You, it's hard to process, and you realize the culture's a little more like you kind of got to just get in there. And so he's trying to get in there, but he can't. And so what does the Bible say that he does? He runs ahead, and he sees a sycamore tree, and he climbs up in it. Now, 
When I think of climbing trees, who, Giovanni, who usually climbs trees? Who? Is it kids or is it, at, is it adult men or is it children? What do you think? It's usually kids. I mean, if you're walking down the road and you saw me trying to climb up in a tree, what would you be thinking? You'd be like, what's that grown man doing trying to climb that tree? He's going to break his neck. You know, you don't tend to think of that. So, and I think it was very similar in that culture where here is a, a sophisticated, wealthy, uh, affluent man, short little guy, but pretty sophisticated, climbing up in a tree. He must have been very desperate to see Jesus. As a matter of fact, what we see him doing is he is humbling himself, and he is, in a sense, becoming like a little child. Look back in Luke chapter 18. If you remember, Jesus talks about when they brought the children to Jesus, um, there he's called the children to him, and he said, Suffer little children to come unto me, and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God. Verily I say unto you, whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child shall in no wise enter therein. So Zacchaeus here is behaving like a child, but he's also demonstrating the right attitude here of, I'm prepared to go to any lengths to see Jesus, and his, his, it shows that his heart is really in the right place. And it, very, it really contrasts with the rich young ruler who comes and says, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This, I've done this and this and this. It's the total opposite. And it was a total opposite of most people in the day and age in which Jesus was ministering. Very few were willing to humble themselves. And even today, very few people are willing to become like a little child, to get to that point in their life where they recognize, I'm not okay, I'm not making it, I'm not content, I'm, I'm not uh, good, I need help. That is a hard place to be. And the older uh, we get, uh, the harder it is to admit. When you're, when you're young and you're a child, you have no problem going around asking everybody to help you. You learn if you put on a certain cute face, you can get almost anything you want for a while, you know, and then it's not so cute anymore. But as you get older, you, you learn, don't even don't admit you need help. You're okay. And so it becomes difficult for people to admit they need the Lord Jesus. Okay, let's go back to verse number five and notice that when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and he saw him. So in your mind, you see Zacchaeus in the tree, but what if Jesus just carries on by? I mean, there's so many people he can't get in, so the chances, you know, maybe he can kind of see Jesus' head through there. Uh, but then as he's coming along, Jesus looks up in the tree, and of course probably almost everybody looked up in the tree, and Jesus then saw him and said, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. Jesus saw him. He was surrounded by a crowd. He was in the midst of a lot of people, but Jesus was aware. Jesus knew that he was trying to find a way through the crowd. Jesus knew he had ran ahead. Jesus knew he was in that tree. Jesus knew what was going on in his life. And I, and I love that. And Jesus knew his name. I don't think he had a name tag, but Jesus knew who he was. And what a thrill that must have been for Zacchaeus when Jesus called his name and said, I want to spend some time with you today. I love that about the Lord Jesus. He knows who we are. He knows your name. He knows my name. He knows what we're dealing with. He knows where we're at, and he cares about us. And he is especially attentive when we are at a stage in our life where we are humble, where we are broken, and where we are seeking for him. Zacchaeus received Jesus joyfully. We see that. That's the next thing in verse number six. He made haste and came down, and underline that in your Bible, received him joyfully. Received him joyfully. That's a great way to receive Jesus. I mean, with excitement, with enthusiasm, with, with, with joy. He was uh, so excited about Jesus coming to his house. 
There's a lot of other places in the book of Luke where we, re we read about people receiving Jesus with joy. You think about the announcement at Jesus' birth, good tidings of great joy. You think about um, Jesus' mother, the joy she had at his birth. Think about John the Baptist, even in Elizabeth's womb, leaping for joy. It ought to be the most wonderful thing in the world that Jesus would know our name and Jesus would want to be, to be with us. And there's a sense in which just as Jesus wanted to go to Zacchaeus' house and spend time with him, Jesus wants to come into the life of every single person. And if you are saved, it ought to be the most amazing thing to think, I can spend time with Jesus. Jesus is in your life. Jesus uh, is, is with you at every moment through the Holy Spirit. And if you're listening, if, you're, if you've never had your life changed by Jesus, He loves you, He cares about you, He died for you, and He wants to spend time with you. But we have to receive Him. So many people don't receive Jesus with joy. They reject Jesus. They despise Jesus. They, they have no time for Jesus. And so Jesus won't come and won't, won't uh, bless those people. But if we'll receive Him with joy, then He'll do great things in our lives. All right, look at verse number 7. When they saw it, they all murmured. Now, this is the they here, there's always a they, isn't there? There's always the, the crowd. There's always the group of people who don't like what's happening. And what do they say? They're kind of murmuring. And murmuring, murmuring is one of those words that the definition of it is kind of the way that it actually sounds. So, murmuring. It's kind of just this like mumbling, you know, this kind of critical mumbling that's going on. And people are kind of like, you know, I don't really think we should be going over there and everything. I mean, Jesus, you know, he's like, it's one of the worst things in the world. You know, Jesus, I'm not going. You know, it's just like this, this kind of rumbling that goes on. Because look what they say. He's gone to be guest with a man that's a sinner. <gasps> he's hanging out with a sinner. Who... What other type of human beings could Jesus spend time with? We're all sinners. But it shows a lot about the attitude of the they here. The crowd generally is thinking, we're a bunch of really good people. Jesus found, I mean, Jesus got some great people. We're not, we're not a sinner like this evil publican. We're the good people. And Jesus, his attitude is, if you think you're, if you think you're okay, I really... I can't do much for you. But this guy, he believes he's a sinner. I can do something for him. Remember, he said he came not to, uh, not to make those, for those that are whole, but for those that need a doctor. And so they all were sinners, but most of them were not willing to admit it. And that's a big problem in our world today. That's why a lot of people don't want to accept Jesus, have no time for Jesus, because they don't see how sick they are. They don't see how sinful they are. But Zacchaeus realized it. And Zacchaeus was grateful that the Lord Jesus would come and be with him. So he was criticized. You know, if, you're, if we're going to serve the Lord, if we're going to do something for the Lord, we're always going to be criticized. We just have to accept that. We have to learn to deal with that. Uh, obviously, we don't want to be, um, you know, where we don't listen to our critics, but uh, we also can't listen to him all the time, because um, anytime we step out by faith, there's going to be criticism, and Jesus was constantly criticized. Now, notice what happens in verse number eight. They go back, there's a meal, and, you know, I really think that in verse six, somewhere along the, the way here, verse six, when he receives Jesus joyfully, is when Jesus is saved. At some point, he accepts, Zacchaeus is saved, not Jesus is saved. Jesus doesn't need to get saved, is when Zacchaeus got saved. Because in verse number 8, Zacchaeus stands up, so um, very likely they're having a meal, and it, it, it's possible that quite a few of Jesus' disciples went with them. And then Jesus stands up and says to the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything... From any man, by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said, This day 
does salvation come to this house? For as much as he also is a son of Abraham. So it, we, don't, we don't read everything about what goes on. We don't read everything about their conversation. But what we see happening is Zacchaeus is a changed man. How do we know he's a changed man? Because he does what is very hard for most people to do. He is willing to give. And it seems like the more, the more that we have, the harder it is to give. And yet, he, the, the other rich man, he went away because he, ha, he had all these riches and he didn't want to give them away. But Zacchaeus says, I want to give half of it away. And if I have um, taken something I shouldn't have, I'm going to give back four times, which was way more than the law required. The law required adding only 20% to it. But he says, I'm going to give back four times everything that I've taken. So what are we seeing happen? We are seeing the fruit of his salvation. He wasn't saved by the works. He was saved by trusting in Jesus. But he demonstrated his salvation by his works. When he says in verse number nine that he is a son of Abraham, that's talking about how Abraham believed God and it was counted for righteousness. Galatians chapter 3, verses 6 to 9 says this, Even as Abraham believed God, and it was accounted to him for righteousness, know ye therefore that they which are of faith, the same are the children of Abraham. So how do we become a child of Abraham? How do we become a son of Abraham? How did Zacchaeus become a son of Abraham? He believed like Abraham believed. That's the way that a person is saved. But then truly saved people will demonstrate their faith. Their life will be changed. You can't meet Jesus and not be changed. And his life demonstrated that he was saved by the way he wanted to give back. Let me just uh, give you one other verse on this point. James chapter 2, uh, verses 14 to 18 says this, What does it profit, my brethren? Though a man say he have faith and have not works, can faith save him? If a brother or sister be naked and destitute of daily food, and one of you say to them, Depart in peace, be ye warmed and filled, notwithstanding you give them not those things which are needful to the body, what doth it profit? Even so faith, if it hath not works, is dead, being alone. James goes so far as to say that if you don't produce any works, then I seriously doubt you have actual faith. But in verse 18, he says, A man may say, Thou hast faith and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. So real faith is going to produce works. And that's what we see happening here in Zacchaeus. And it's a great example. And we should be demonstrating very clearly that if, if we're saved, it should be obvious to those that are around us. It's to change everything about our attitudes, uh, our priorities, uh, everything about our lives. Uh, and we want to get things right. I think that's what we learned from Zacchaeus as well as he got saved. And he wanted, to, he wanted to make things right. He didn't just sort of say, well, that's all in the past and now I'm still rich. He's like, no, I'm going to try to go back and make reconciliation or make restitution. And so that's important. Okay, let's go to the next section of verses. Let's go to Luke chapter 19, verses 18 to 27. So then Jesus um, speaks a parable. The Bible says, uh, of course, we need to look at verse 10 just briefly. Let me hit on that, where Jesus then says, The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which is lost. And that's just a great promise, isn't it? Jesus is letting them know, I have come, I've come to seek, and I've come to save those that are lost. And the implication was that most of the people that heard Jesus didn't see themselves as lost. So they were never found and they were never saved. But if we will recognize we are lost, that we, that we uh, are, are not okay, then we are in a good position for Jesus to find us and to save us. But then verse 11 says, As they heard these things, he, a he added and spake a parable because he was nigh to Jerusalem. So, What's happening, they're listening, the crowds are listening to Jesus, and they're getting close to Jerusalem, and they're about to go in. This is the triumphant, a triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Uh, look down in chapter 18, 
and look at verses, um, let's see, or chapter 19, look at verses <clears throat> 36. As they went, they spread their clothes in the way, and when he was come nigh, even now at the descent of the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of the disciples began to rejoice and to praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. So they are about to enter Jerusalem, and they're about to, basically, they're hoping this guy's the Messiah, and they're hoping he's going to set up his kingdom. So with that in mind, we come back to verse 11, and the Bible says there, they thought the kingdom of God should immediately appear. So they really believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and that he was going to set up his kingdom at this time. And so Jesus has to explain that the first time he came, he offered himself as the king, but it was rejected, and so he came to save, and it wasn't until he comes back the second time that he's going to set up his kingdom. And so that's the context of this parable. Okay, so let's go through the parable here, and we'll explain uh, what's happening and, and, learn, and learn a few things from it. Um, the Bible says that he said to them in verse 12, a certain nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and to return. So in this analogy, we're talking about a kingdom that someone's going to receive. This is um, uh, clearly talking about Jesus. He's the king. And he's the, so he's the nobleman. But in order for him to receive the kingdom, he was going to go into a far country and then come back. So what he's saying is, Jesus is saying, I'm going to have to actually go away to a far country, back to heaven, but then I'm going to return. And it's not until I return that I'm going to have this kingdom. So that's the first thing that they had to realize is that uh, Jesus was not going to set up his kingdom at this time. But he's coming back, and when he does, he's going to come as the king. And that's what we're still waiting on. We're still looking for that. Uh, the next thing that happens is the rapture of the church. The church is taken away. Then there's a period of judgment on this world, and then Jesus returns, Revelation 19. And uh, when he comes, it will be as the king, as the judge. But look at verse 13. So, He's loving them though he's going away. He's going, to come, he's going to come back. And he says that he called him ten, his ten servants, and he delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. So he gathers those that are his servants, and he gives each of them a pound. Uh, now, this was uh, more than a uh, pound. Like if you read about old English pounds, they were worth a lot more than pounds are today. And the, the pound here is, was worth about three months' wages. So pretty valuable, um, you know, depending on obviously how much you make. But, you know, several thousand pounds. Could be as much as 10,000 pounds here uh, that uh, they, are, they are being given. And look what he says, occupy till I come. Uh, just underline that, occupy till I come. Now, if I said to somebody... Uh, occupy the back office, we tend to think of it like stay in the back office. You know, you're the occupant. But the idea of occupy here is not just sit there, but to be actually occupied while you're there, being busy. So he's basically said, I want you to take all 10 of you, take your pound and use it, invest it, uh, do something with it that's going to produce something because I'm going uh, to come back. So do, does that make sense there? So they're, they're meant to be busy with what they have. And the picture here is that our, our Lord Jesus has left, but he has given us spiritual gifts and opportunities to serve the Lord. And what does he want us to do? He wants us to be using them. He wants us to use our time and our talents, and our treasure. He wants us to be witnessing. He wants us to be serving. He wants us to be using the opportunities that He's given to us before He returns. Okay, so 
That's uh, what that's talking about. Now, verse 14, the Bible says, but his citizens hated him. So there's another group of people that are not his servants. They should have been under his leadership, but they hate him. And this would have been applied to the nation of Israel, and we could also apply it to anyone who's rejected the, the lordship of Christ. Verse 14, they sent a message after him saying, we will not have this man to reign over us. And they were, they're about to nail Jesus to a cross in just a few days in the book of Luke. So there was another group of people that don't want Jesus to reign at all. Verse 15, it came to pass that when he was returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to be called unto him to whom he had given the money that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. So again, you see, see the trading there that's connected to Occupy. They were supposed to use it and they were supposed to do something with it. Uh, it was like an investment. Like sometimes even if you're starting a business, you can get a loan to get a business up and going. But the idea is you use that money to get started to make more money, and then you can repay the loan. Um, so he's like, let's go find out what my servants have done with what I gave them. Then came the first and said, Lord, thy pound hath gained ten pounds. Now, notice, uh, first of all, that it, he says, thy pound. In other words, he was given the money, but it wasn't his. It still belonged to his master. And that's the thing we have to remember about our lives about everything we have, it all belongs to God. Even our, down to our children, they belong to God. And so God is going to come back and He, uh, well, for us, the church, we're going to be raptured out. We're going to stand before Him, but, but we're going to give an account for what we have done with the life that He has entrusted us with, with the mind, with the talents, with the treasure, with the opportunities uh, that He has given us. So it's His and he says, here's what happened. Your pound has gained 10 pounds. So a tenfold increase. And the Lord said to him, well, thou good servant, you have been faithful in very little, have authority over 10. So really in comparison to all that the nobleman had, the one pound was very little, but he had produced a lot. And so he said, you're going to rule over 10 cities. Now, those ten cities, that's in the kingdom. Jesus is going to set up a kingdom here on this earth when he, when he returns. And there's going to, for a thousand years, he's going to reign on the earth. And so he says, your reward is you're going to rule over these cities. So this is one of the reasons we believe in a literal kingdom here on this earth is because the reward is ten cities to have authority over. The second servant comes and says, Lord, thy pound has gained five. And he said, likewise to him, be over five cities. And I think that's great there as well because not all of us are going to have the same um, results. Not all of us are going to have the same fruit. Not all of us are going to have the same, uh, the same increase, so to speak. One guy produces 10, the other guy produces 5, but they are both commended. Good job, you've done well. Obviously, the one guy gets 10 cities, the other guy gets 5 cities, but there's no sense in which the second man is, is a kind of um, less commended, the Lord uh, says the same thing to him. So we're not in a race against each other. We're not trying to outdo one another as Christians. We're really just in a race against our own potential. But then we have the third guy comes to, to the Lord, and look what he says. Verse 20, Lord, behold, here's your pound. I've kept it laid up in a napkin. So he's like, I kept it safe. I didn't lose it. And then he begins to make some excuses. He's not done anything with it. He says, actually, I, was, I, I, I feared thee. I was a little bit afraid of you because I know how tough you are. You're austere. You, you, you take up what, what you've not laid down and you reap what you didn't sow. And the Lord says, you're going to be judged out of your own mouth. You're a wicked servant. You knew I was an austere man, taking up I'd laid not down a reap and I did not sow. So why didn't you at least put it in the bank and it could have made some interest? So actually he's making excuses. And the Lord's going to return one day and we're going to give an account of our lives. And we can't just say, well, Lord, you know, I... 
here I am. Um, you know, I didn't really do a lot for you, but um, I was just too nervous. That's, that's not going to be good enough with the Lord. He, that, that's pretty wicked. That, that's basically saying we don't really believe he's going to come back. Because if we really believe he's coming back, we should be busy. We should be serving. We should be witnessing. We should be doing all that we can. And so the Bible says in verse 24, the Lord said, Take from him the pound and give it to him that have ten. And they said, Lord, he's got ten pounds. So they actually took the one he had and gave it to the guy with ten. Because he hadn't done anything with the one. He didn't. He, if you gave him more, he wouldn't do anything with more. But the guy with ten is going to be faithful. And so he's given it to him. Verse 26, For I say unto you that unto everyone that hath, uh, every one which hath shall be given from him that hath not, even that he hath shall be taken away from him. Now this man was not cast out of the kingdom. And those that have not been faithful in their service to the Lord, those who are believers in Jesus, our salvation is not at risk. We're not talking about losing salvation. We're talking about losing reward. So um, verse 27, the enemies of Jesus, they are they're killed. They're slain before the Lord, but this servant isn't. But yet he misses out on the rewards that could have been his. And so the lesson for us from this parable is, what are we doing for Jesus? You know, the Lord has given each of us a life. The Lord has given each of us talents. The Lord has given each of us opportunities. And we want to be faithful to use what he's given us. It's so easy to think, well, I can't do what someone else can do um, and make excuses. I don't feel like I have what I need. It's really difficult. Lord, you don't understand. But all those are our excuses. The truth of the matter is we have the Word of God, we have the Holy Spirit, we have the powerful gospel. And so the Lord is asking us just to take what we have and to use it for His honor, for His glory. And we want to hear well done. And I think Zacchaeus, if we connect the two, Zacchaeus, he looks at what he has and he says, I've got all of this. I'm going to do something with it. I'm going to, I'm going to use it. I'm going to give back. I'm going, to, I'm going to live out my salvation. And that's the type of example that we want to have is we want to be busy. We want to be occupied. We want to be, in a sense, trading. We want to be um, working to use and leverage our lives and our opportunities for the honor and the glory of God. So he's coming back. He's going to punish those that are his enemies that have rejected him, and he's going to reward those that are faithful servants, and we want to be living for that well done. Well, let's pray together this evening. Thank you very much for uh, joining us, and uh, I hope that if you're like Zacchaeus and you're searching to know that the Lord is already searching for you. And if you've been found, that we'll be busy serving the Lord. He could come back at any moment, and we want to be um, found faithful. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the opportunity we've had to open your word tonight. Thank you for both of these passages of Scripture that show us how much you uh, care for us, how much you long for us to come to you and that you are seeking and saving that which is lost. And God, I pray if there's someone uh, listening who uh, feels lost and feels uh, like Zacchaeus, that they need you, God, that you would open their hearts, that they would believe on you, they'd be saved, and that they'd be uh, dramatically changed like Zacchaeus was. God, help us who are your servants. Help us to be faithful. Help us to, to take on board this uh, very sobering moment when we stand before you and our works are judged and we are either rewarded or we lose out and miss out on the rewards. And God, we want to be, we want to be found faithful. We want to hear well done and we want to bring honor and glory to you. We ask these things in Jesus' name.